Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm glad for those of you that were with me before that you've come back for more and uh, I hope uh, you'll be as uh, inspired isn't the right word, as interested by the topics that we talk about today as I was in preparation. The last 10 days or so uh, of current oh. events have made uh, this lesson so much more relevant. I think it's my, uh, there we go. Let's see if slideshow won't work now. Nope, still sleeping. Huh. Well, I can do this a different way, although it's not desirable. I'll do it this way just so I don't get completely behind. Um, so anyway, last, last time I was discussing the splits uh, within the Democratic Party that happened um, uh, in connection with the 1948 presidential election process. There was a split represented by the third party candidacy by Henry Wallace, the candidate identified with the Progressive Party. There was a split represented by the creation of the Democratic States Rights Party, more commonly known as the Dixiecrats, which resulted in the candidacy of Strom Thurmond, governor of South Carolina. Then there was the Dump Truman Draft Eisenhower movement within the Democratic Party itself. We've already talked about the announcement of the candidacy of Henry Wallace, the Progressive Citizens of America candidate. Oh, for crying out loud. That just doesn't want to work for me. I'm sorry. So I'll just talk and not have the, uh, the aid there. Um, we began discussing Strom Thurmond and his candidacy in the rebellion of the Southern Democrats against Harry Truman's candidacy when, he, when we ran out of time last time. So let's pick up with Strom, Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats. And I'm going to, because I think these images are so worthwhile, I'm going to make one more attempt to get this thing to work for me. Sorry. Am I muted? No, you are not. You are unmuted. Okay, thank you. All right, so Strom Thurmond. Let's talk about Strom Thurmond. He's a fascinating character. Uh, J. Strom Thurmond, the governor of South Carolina, was 45 years old as of January the 1st, 1948, the year that we're focusing on. As mentioned earlier, in 1948, delegates from Mississippi and Alabama walked out of the Democratic National Convention in July of that year to protest the civil rights planks in the platform of the Democratic Party approved by the convention and supported by Truman. They and other Southern Democrats promptly met in Birmingham on July 17th of 1948 and formed a new political party, which they named the State's Rights Democratic Party. It became more commonly known as the Dixiecrats. The party's main goal was negative, to thwart the enactment of federal laws and or executive actions designed to enact the civil rights planks that I just mentioned and Harry Truman's initiatives with respect to civil rights. If they had been successful in thwarting Truman's re-election, they hoped that they would be able to sustain the status quo of segregation and Jim Crow in the South. This was motivated by their desire to retain the second-class citizenship of the Negro population in their individual states. Representatives, or, or rather representative of the Dixiecrat agenda Strom Thurmond became the nominee of the Dixiecrats for the presidency. So the story of Strom Thurmond's candidacy was more the story of Southern Democrats' opposition and resistance to Truman's and the Democratic Party's civil rights proposals and initiatives, and less about the real expectation that, Thurm uh, that, that uh, Thurmond would be elected president of the United States. It was about political leverage. Remember that. As I described in some detail last time, the buildup to Thurman's candidacy had been developing for some time, just to briefly review that. President Roosevelt had signed an executive order in June of 1941, attempting to eliminate discrimination in uh, the federal world of employment. 
that expired with the end of the war, basically. By October of 1947, the 15-member committee on civil rights, which Truman had created in, in December of 1946, that committee presented Truman with its report entitled to secure these rights, the report of the President's Committee on Civil Rights. That report proposed, quote, to end immediately all discrimination and segregation based on race, color, creed, or national origin in the organization and activities of all branches of the armed services. It also proposed to establish a permanent Civil Rights Commission, a Joint Congressional Committee on Civil Rights, and a Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice. Also to develop federal protection from lynching, a permanent Fair Employment Practice Commission, to abolish poll taxes, and urged other measures to ensure that the rights contained in the U.S. Constitution would be protected for all citizens of the United States by federal action if necessary. The full text of this report may be found at that website, which we talked about some last time and Lori emailed that to everybody on the email list. I would encourage each of you to take the time to read and study and reflect upon this document as it formed the blueprint and emphasis for the legislative actions in the areas of civil rights that followed its publication all the way down to the present day, quite frankly. And it's really pertinent in terms of current events. It's really interesting to examine that document in that respect, which I don't intend to do in detail because of its length, but let me at least share with you the topic headings of that report. I think, as I said before, it's extremely important to think about the topics the committee addressed especially given what's happening in the United States, even now in 2020, some 72 or 73 years later. Here is the table of contents from that report. So they start out with the American heritage, the promise of freedom and equality, basically the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and particularly with an emphasis on the Bill of Rights. Then they go through the positives, the record of the United States in dealing with these issues of civil rights and recognize the fact that we've fallen at that time short of the goal of equality for all of our citizenry. They recognize the facts, our diverse population, signs of recent progress that have been made, and then they go and look at the conditions of those rights with respect to our citizenry as they then existed. And there are four subheadings under that topic. They then talk about the topic of segregation and relook at that. And then they look specifically at civil rights in Washington, DC, our nation's capital, because that is a spot which theoretically at least has been under the control legislatively of the Congress. The third thing they looked at then, having reviewed those things, was our government's responsibility in securing these civil rights. And you can read those things for yourself without me looking at them specifically. But if you go and, uh, and get a topic of that, I uh, get a copy of that, which you can get from the Truman Library website, it's important to keep these headings in mind as you read through the contents underneath each one of these headings to keep yourself oriented as to what you're reading about and what they're attempting to express. It's very well written, it's long, it's very well written, and when you get to the proposed action steps that they have in there, it will help you to see and understand what Harry Truman tried to do, which we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. So, uh, we turn a little bit to Truman, but come back to Strom Thurmond. So on January 7th, 1948, Truman delivered his State of the Union address to a joint session of Congress. And we'll talk about the contents of that speech in more detail in just a little while. I wanted to point out at this point in the lecture that in that speech, just three months following the delivery and publication of the committee's report in October of 1947, he called for the protection of the civil rights of all U.S. citizens and promised to send 
a special message to the Congress requesting a civil rights package. Our first goal, Truman said in the State of the Union, is to secure fully the essential human rights of our citizens. Following his State of the Union promise, President Truman sent a special mes message to Congress on February the 2nd, 1948, just a month later, calling for prompt implementation of the President's Commission on Civil Rights recommendations. Southerners immediately threatened a filibuster and openly expressed their opposition to the President's civil rights proposals. Finally, in July, at their national convention, the Democrats voted to include in their platform, with President Truman's encouragement, a plank calling for the enactment of the civil rights recommendations set forth in the report of the President's Commission on Civil Rights. This was apparently the straw that broke the camel's back for many of the Southern Democrats. This was the action that prompted their split from the Democratic Party and the creation of the state's rights Democratic Party or the Dixiecrats. So Strom Thurmond ultimately became the Dixiecrats presidential candidate on the basis of the South's virulent opposition to the civil rights platform positions of the Democratic Party and the actions President Truman had taken and was proposing to take if elected president in November. That, I believe, is the story, more than the biography and history of J. Strom Thurmond, who in many respects was pretty liberal for a Southern politician of his day. Let me say that again. Strom Thurmond, given the time, was in many respects pretty liberal for a Southern politician of his day. To be fair to Thurmond, I wanted to share some things that Andrew Bush included in his book about the 1948 election. And here I'm quoting from Bush's book. An attorney and the son of an attorney, Thurman had served a number of local positions in Edgefield, South Carolina, including superintendent of education, town and county attorney, had been elected to the South Carolina Senate and a state judgeship. When World War II came, Thurman joined the Army, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and receiving 18 commendations for his actions at Normandy as part of the 82nd Airborne Division. Upon his return from the war, Thurman embarked on a complicated statewide political career. In 1946, he was elected governor of South Carolina on a platform of reform and accountability against the representative of a clique that had been running state politics in South Carolina. He was successful. As governor, he worked to expand the state educational system, increasing pay for both white and black teachers, and won the plaudits of the NAACP and the ACLU for insisting on the arrest of the white suspects in the nationally notorious lynching of a gentleman by the name of Willie Earl. As an opponent of both the South Carolina poll tax and the federal anti-poll tax legislation, Thurman would say, quote, I believe in liberal progressive government on the proper level only those functions specifically delegated to the Constitution, in the Constitution, to the federal government, should be handled at the federal level. So there you can see the seeds of the segregation, not segregation, of the states' rights argument on which the Southern Democrats based the creation of their party and their political argument. I'm moving away from quoting Bush here. This is me. This is the same philosophical and ideological argument that the Southern states made in separating themselves from the Union at the beginning of the Civil War. They had joined the Union voluntarily. They should be allowed to separate themselves from the Union if they wanted to voluntarily. It was their argument of the sovereignty of the state in that respect over the federal government that was the basis for their ideological argument 
to split from the, to justify their split from the union. States' rights, essentially. And here that argument is rearing its head again with respect to the relationship between the powers of the federal government and the powers retained by states' government. Interesting to look at that, how arguments along those lines continue to repeat themselves. You may hear those to some extent again today, but not as much. Returning to Bush's quote about Thurman. At the same time, though, Thurman was governor of South Carolina, the epitome of the Deep South, the first state to secede in 1860 in the state whose militia had fired on Fort Sumter to initiate the Civil War. In the 1940s, support for segregation was a given of serious participation in state politics in South Carolina, as in other Southern states. And Thurman showed no reluctance to toe that line. After having praised Truman in a radio broadcast in October 1947, he grew increasingly critical of the Truman administration's moves on civil rights. Louisville Journal Courier correspondent John Ed Pierce noted that Thurman was not the classic race hater. He is a man deeply troubled by threat of social change that would destroy a way of life to which he is accustomed and raised into a position of legal equality a people he has been reared to regard as inferior. He is torn, again, I'm quoting the journalist here, Thurman is torn, as the majority of Southerners are, between a desire to be a decent Christian man and an inner insistence on a racial system that is in itself unchristian. Returning to Bush's quotes, Thurman, whose strength was highly concentrated in the South, posed no threat outside Dixie, but might, if things went his way, actually win enough Southern states to make the Electoral College, the, the math of the Electoral College, very difficult for Truman. The hope of the segregationists was that a general election stalemate in the Electoral College might be leveraged into a more favorable regional policy from Washington. Together, Thurman and Wallace, Henry Wallace, had the potential to skim away enough of the ideological edges of the Democratic Party to leave Truman with an insufficient remnant to win. That was the split, that was the strategy. I can't leave this section about the Dixiecrats and Strom Thurman, however, without sharing one important aspect of Strom Thurman's personal story, which I think tells a bigger story about the hypocrisy to a large extent of the South. At the tender age of 15, Strom Thurman entered Clemson. After graduation, young Strom returned to Edgefield where he took up, res to, where he took up teaching at Edgefield High School and moved back home to his father's house. I'll let David, I'll, I'll let historian David Pietruska take up the story from here. Upon returning to his father's house in Edgefield, Strom took up with one of the help, teenage Carrie Butler, who cooked and cleaned and was beautiful and was black. Love, Carrie would recall, is blind. It's colorblind. Besides all that hate talk is just politics. Strom found excuses to be with Carrie in the kitchen and in the family vegetable garden. Quoting Carrie here, he knew everything about fruits and vegetables, she recalled. He taught agriculture in the local high school and wrote articles in the papers. We'd go out to the orchards and pick peaches and he'd know exactly when they were ripe and which ones would be the sweetest. One thing led to another. It was a big house. There were busy people always out doing something. Love finds a way. And so did the creation of new human life. On October the 12th, 1925 in Aiken, South Carolina, 20 miles from Edgefield, Carrie Butler gave birth to a daughter S.E. May, S.E. May, J. Strom Thurman 
was the father. S.E. May's parentage wasn't ever publicly acknowledged during Strom Thurmond's lifetime. I found the following summary of the life of S.E. May Washington Wallace in Wikipedia, very interesting, and thought I would share it with you since I believe it's all generally accurate and particularly eye-opening. S.E. May Washington Williams was an American teacher, author, and writer. She is best known as the eldest child of Strom Thurmond, governor of South Carolina from 1947 to 1951, and longtime United States Senator known for his pro-racial segregation policy. Of mixed race, she was born to Carrie Butler, a 16-year-old African-American girl who worked as a household servant for Thurman's parents. And Thurman, then 22 and unmarried. Washington Williams grew up in the family of one of her mother's sisters, her aunt, not learning of her biological parents until 1938 when her mother came for a visit and informed Essie May she was her mother. She graduated from college, that is Essie May, earned a master's degree, married, raised a family, and had a 30-year professional career in education. Washington Williams did not reveal her biological father's identity until she was 78 years old after Thurman's death at the age of 100 in 2003. Though he had little to do with her upbringing, he had paid for her college education and took an interest in her and her family all his life. In 2005, Essie May published her autobiography, Dear Senator, a memoir by the daughter of Strom Thurman, which was nominated for the National Book Award and a Pulitzer Prize. In 2003, after Thurman died, his family acknowledged that Strom Thurman had fathered a child with the family's 16-year-old black housekeeper. That child, obviously, was SMA. During his 1948 campaign, Thurman said the following in a speech being met with large cheers by the assembled supporters. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's not enough troops in the Army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. So what would this mean regarding the racial classification of Strom Thurmond's daughter, Essie May? The following is from a PBS Frontline documentary entitled, Who is Black? One Nation's Definition, quoting F. James Davis, who was a retired professor of sociology at Illinois State University. To be considered black in the United States, not even half of one's ancestry must be African black. But will one fourth do, or one eighth, or less? The nation's answer to the question, who is black, has long been that a black is any person with any known African black ancestry. This definition reflects the long experience with slavery and later with Jim Crow segregation. In the South, it became known as the one drop rule, meaning that a single drop of black blood makes a person black. It is also known as the one black ancestor rule. Some courts called it the traceable amount rule. And anthropologists call it the hypo descent rule, meaning that racially mixed persons are assigned the status of the subordinate group. This definition emerged from the American South to become the nation's definition, generally accepted by whites and blacks. Blacks had no other choice. As we shall see in the Frontline documentary, if you watch it, I'm still quoting that gentleman, this American cultural definition of blacks is taken for granted as readily by judges, affirmative action officers, and black protesters 
as it is by the Ku Klux Klan. Therefore, if Thurman, who was certainly familiar with the one drop rule, was to be taken at his word, there were not enough federal troops in the army to force him to admit his daughter, Essie May, into his theaters, his swimming pool, his home, or his churches. There is no doubt that the Dixiecrats had as their prime goal sustaining the status quo of segregation and Jim Crow. And accordingly, the second class citizenship of the daughter of Strom Thurmond, Essie Mae Washington Williams. So with that titillating story, since this is a class about Harry Truman in the 1948 presidential campaign and election, let's turn next to Harry Truman's State of the Union address in January of 1948. But before we do that, <clears throat> I'd like to give you all an opportunity and take a pause and see if there are any questions or comments about what we talked about so far before we turn away from the Dixiecrats, the split in the party, uh, and the story of Strom Thurmond. Remember to unmute yourself. You either find your mute icon down in your left-hand corner or you find your picture and un and click the unmute um, blue box. I know you're all shy. Um, I'm unmuted, Judy. Judy, you gotta speak right up to your microphone. I'm not shy, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people probably share that feeling. Thank you for sharing all that, D J David. That was amazing. More, more to think about. David, um, this is Wendy. Um, my mom grew up in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And in 1950, the librarian got fired for, they said she was a communist, but the main reason that she got fired was because she wanted to let black children check out books in the library. And there's a book out called The Dismissal of Miss Ruth Brown. And also there were um, some black people living in um, the back part of their house, which used to be the servants' quarters, not that they had servants, but anyway, my mom just really, you know, was so upset that in bad weather, she just walked across the street to the high school, and the black people had to walk way across town in bad weather to go to their school, and it just, you know, um, people had to know, and it's just shocking that anybody would have been okay with that. <laughs> David, this is Mark. Yes, Mark. And uh, I don't know if anybody saw the uh, History Channel miniseries on Ulysses S. Grant, but it was very interesting that uh, during uh, Reconstruction, which President Grant had uh, sponsored, kind of ran out of steam. Reconstruction fatigued both the North and the South, which then allowed a lot of the original Southern ideas, ideals, etc., to permeate and manifested itself to where it got to, I guess, is where you were talking about with Senator Thurman. That's all. David, Barbara. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know you're going into the speech. My question, having read it, is who was his speechwriter? <laughs> uh, there was a guy named Sam Rosenman and Clark Clifford both. I think Rosenman might have been out of the administration by then. And there's a guy by the name of George Elsey, who I think was the principal writer for most of Truman's speeches. But keep in mind, Harry Truman's attitude about the words contained in his speeches was, even though someone else may have written a goodly portion of his speech, the words were still his and he had the responsibility for the contents of the speech. Mm -hmm. He felt that very strongly. Even though someone else may have written the outline for the speech, he didn't generally give it until after he'd read it over and modified it himself. Surely. Well, it was amazing how much is still not done. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's a good segue to where we're going. So I'm gonna ask all of you to really try hard to put on your intellectual or thinking caps as we go through the rest of the class this morning, because this is gonna be more 
listening and thinking, I think, about concepts and ideas, which are extremely important, but in the context of today, even more important. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, I'm going to go back to share the screen. And I'm going to mute all again. There we go. All right, David. Yep. All right, I got to get my slides. Oh, darn it. It's gone to sleep again. I got to quit using this thing. All right, this, this, I don't think I'm going to have many pictures, so I'm not going to slide share here. It's just, it's gone to sleep again, and I'm just going to talk. <clears throat> so as I previously mentioned, historian Andrew Bush writes in his book about the 1948 election, quote, Harry Truman's open re-election campaign began on January the 7th, 1948, when he delivered his State of the Union message to a joint session of Congress. Other students of the period believe that Truman kicked off his campaign in October of 1947, when he, gave a, when he gave a national radio broadcast to the American people announcing that he was calling the Congress into a special session, effective November the 17th, to consider the problems of inflation and high prices at home and emergency aid abroad. In that radio broadcast, President Truman said, since VJ Day, we have moved steadfastly toward two goals. We have sought peace and prosperity, prosperity for all our people, peace for all the world. As we measure our progress towards these goals and chart the course ahead, we find that recent events have raised new and dangerous obstacles in our path. Our domestic prosperity is endangered by the threat of inflation. The peace of the world is endangered by hunger and cold in other lands. These obstacles must be overcome by prompt and courageous action. Legislation by the Congress is essential. The need is too pressing. The results of delay too grave for congressional action to wait until the next regular session in January. So there is President Truman laying down the gauntlet to the 80th Republican Congress. Perhaps a speech of substance, perhaps a speech with political purpose, but nevertheless a speech dealing with or at least lifting up these important issues, which he addresses again in his State of the Union message. The point is, when did campaigning begin for his reelection? Some people believe it began with that particular speech to the 80th Congress not with the expectation they would do anything in response to his demand for action, but to set them up to be their opponents in his campaign during the next year. Suffice it to say, the issues that Trump, uh, Truman raised in his radio broadcast and, uh, and his address to the special session remained unresolved legislatively as the year 1948 dawned. He addressed them, as I mentioned, again in his State of the Union. David McCullough in his Truman biography says that, quote, by the late autumn, it was well known within the official family that Truman was in the race. And by the start of 1948, everyone in Washington had concluded that he was running and that therefore, just about anything he did or said was with that in mind, starting with the State of the Union address. Since it was such an important factor in Harry Truman's 1948 re-election campaign, let's consider the State of the Union address that President Truman delivered on January the 7th to a joint session of the Congress. But perhaps more importantly, he delivered it to the American people and to the world. In his introductory remarks, President Truman issued a call for unity within the country. Interestingly, at least to me, he included the following remarks reflecting Truman's fundamental assumptions about the overall nature of the American people and their spirituality and their faith in God. Quoting from the speech, the elements of our speech, uh, the elements of our strength are many. They include our democratic government, our economic system, 
our great natural resources. But these are only partial explanations. The basic source of our strength is spiritual. For we are a people with a faith. We believe in the dignity of man. We believe that he was created in the image of the Father of us all. This is me now. Here, President Truman is clearly making reference to the creation story contained in the first book of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, and the Christian Old Testament, and the belief that humans are created in God's image. The quote from Isaiah 1, 27, the New International Version. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Close quote. So implicit in what Harry Truman is saying in this part of his speech in the introduction is his acceptance of the creation story and its embedded nature in the knowledge of the American people. Complicit with and implicit in the foregoing and what is to come in Truman's speech is an understanding and acceptance of the expressions of truth contained in the Declaration of Independence. Quoting now from the Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, not needing other explanation. They, they prove themselves. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, that is an incredible statement to be made in a short one sentence, I think it's one sentence, one sentence of text. The concepts of the Enlightenment, the concepts of Judeo-Christian belief are wrapped up in that statement, and it is foundational to an understanding of what Harry Truman is saying in this State of the Union address. Returning to his speech, we do not believe that men exist merely to strengthen the state or to be cogs in the economic machine. We do believe that governments are created to serve the people and that economic systems exist to minister to their wants. We have a profound devotion to the welfare and rights of the individual as a human being. The faith of our people has, particularly me has particular meaning at this time in history because of the unsettled and changing state of the world. Now he said these words on January the 7th of 1948. The foregoing, this is me now, the foregoing is a clear statement by the president of his belief in the importance of the faith of the American people and in the Judeo-Christian tenet set forth in the Jewish Bible and the Old Testament book of Genesis, that each individual is created in the image of God as a basic source of the strength of the American people and the expressions of truth set forth in the Declaration of Independence. I, I find this foundational aspect of the State of the Union really fascinating, especially considering the times we are living in today and the rhetoric we're hearing today from the highest levels of governmental power in our country. Anyway, after setting forth some of the specific aspirations and anxieties in the U.S. at the time, and the larger world, Truman says this. We must devote ourselves to finding answers to these anxieties and aspirations. We seek answers which will embody the moral and spiritual elements of tolerance, unselfishness, and brotherhood upon which true freedom and opportunity must rest. 
Let me repeat that one sentence, the foundational basis for what Truman is saying here, looking for answers to the problems that he's dealing with. We seek answers to these problems, which will embody the moral and spiritual elements of tolerance, unselfishness, and brotherhood, upon which true freedom and opportunity must rest. To gather a deeper understanding of just what President Truman was expressing with these words, I'd like to take you to a national radio broadcast that President Truman delivered on October the 30th, 1949, a year and 10 months plus after his State of the Union address. This broadcast was part of a program entitled Religion in American Life. The following is excerpted from that address. And I'm channeling President Truman here. The United States has been a deeply religious nation from its earliest beginnings. The need, which the founders of our country felt, the need to be free to worship God, each man in his own way, was one of the strongest impulses that brought men from Europe to the New World. Building on the foundation of faith, the United States has grown from a small country in the wilderness to a position of great strength and great responsibility among the family of nations. Other countries look today to the United States for leadership in the ways of peace, and it is our task to meet that challenge. I am convinced that we are strong enough to meet the challenge. We are strong enough because we have a profound religious faith. The basic source of our strength as a nation is spiritual. We believe in the dignity of man. We believe that he is created in the image of God, who is the father of us all. It is this faith that makes us determine that every citizen in our own land shall have an equal right and, out, and an equal opportunity to grow in wisdom and in stature, and to play his part in the affairs of our nation. Continuing with that radio broadcast, it is this faith that makes us respect the rights of men everywhere to worship as they please and to live their own lives free from the fear of tyranny and strife. It is this faith that inspires us to work for a world in which life will be more worthwhile, a world of tolerance, unselfishness, and brotherhood, a world that lives according to the precepts of the Sermon on the Mount. I believe that every problem in the world today could be solved if men would only live by the principles of the ancient prophets and the Sermon on the Mount. Each one of us can do his part by a renewed devotion to his religion. If there is any danger to the religious life of our nation, it lies in our taking our religious heritage too much for granted. Religion is not a static thing. It exists not in buildings, but in the minds and hearts of our people. Religion is like freedom. We cannot take it for granted. Man to be free must work at it. And man to be truly religious must work at that too. Unless men live by their faith and practice their faith in their daily lives, religion cannot be a living force in the world today. That is why each of us has a duty to participate actively in the religious life of his community and to support generously his own religious institutions. Just as an act of faith sustained and guided the pioneers in conquering the wilderness, so today an act of faith will sustain and guide us as we work for a just peace, freedom for all, and a world where human life is truly held sacred. Religious faith and religious work must be our reliance as we strive to fulfill our destiny in the world. 
So if you take President Truman at his word, both in his State of the Union address and his radio broadcast on October the 30th, 1949, the goals and specific proposals set forth in his address and his political platform have as their basis a religious faith that lifts up the moral and spiritual elements of tolerance, unselfishness, and brotherhood. I want you to keep that in mind as we consider the details of his State of the Union address, and as you might look that back over on your own if this motivates you to do that again. So let's return to the State of the Union specifically. I think those other things will help you have a deeper understanding of what he's saying here in the State of the Union. President Truman set forth five specific goals in his State of the Union. So what were they? Our first goal is to secure fully the essential human rights of our citizens. Our second goal is to protect and develop our human resources. Our third goal is to conserve and use our natural resources so that they can contribute most effectively to the welfare of our people. Our fourth goal is to lift the standard of living for all our people by strengthening our economic system and sharing more broadly among our people the goods we produce. Our fifth goal is to achieve world peace based on principles of freedom and justice and the equality of all nations. Note that President Truman set forth four distinct goals for things that would be considered domestic policy, things pertinent to the American public and the American experience, and one goal in the area of foreign or international policy. We'll come back over the course of the next couple of weeks and discuss each of these goals in more detail with regard to what President Truman said or proposed in his speech. After setting forth and discussing with specificity his five goals and specific proposals to reach them, he lifts up one further specific additional domestic problem that must be addressed, inflation, which he says affects the other stated goals and our ability to deal with them. Here's what he said about inflation. As we enter the new year, we must surmount one major problem which affects all our goals. That is the problem of inflation. Already inflation in this country is undermining the living standards of millions of families. Food costs too much. Housing has reached fantastic price levels. Parenthetically, I wonder what he'd think if he saw the prices of housing today. Food costs too much. Schools and hospitals are in financial distress. Inflation threatens to bring on disagreement and strife between labor and management. Worst of all, and this was a real overriding fear at the time, worst of all, inflation holds the threat of another depression, just as we had a depression after the unstable boom following World War I. He ends his State of the Union message with the following statements. It is our faith in human dignity that underlies these purposes. It is this faith that keeps us strong, keeps us a, a strong and vital people. This is a time to remind ourselves of these fundamentals. For today, the whole world looks to us for leadership. This is the hour to rededicate ourselves to the faith in mankind that makes us strong. This is the hour to rededicate ourselves to the faith in God that gives us confidence as we face the challenge of the years ahead. If at this point you haven't taken the time to read and study the State of, Union, the State of the Union address, I don't want you to do it now, but I invite and encourage you to do that following this lecture. So in the time remaining, let's begin to discuss some of the proposals and specifics in the State of the Union designed to accomplish the five goals identified in Truman's speech 
and to deal with the issue of inflation. It's also important to be true to the intent of this class to compare what he proposes to the politics of 1948 memorandum we've looked at previously. The politics of the year, the politics of the State of the Union. I'll leave that up to you to do on your own rather than me trying to compare it point by point. The rest of the time today, I wanna to focus on his first goal, which really is the goal that deals with civil, civil rights issues. And as I got to doing what he was saying in his speech and finding some other things to buttress what he was proposing, I thought because of what we're seeing and hearing on the news in the last 10 or 11 days and what we're most likely to be seeing and hearing going forward, to be properly educated citizens, we really need to know about this stuff from this time period. This is where the foundational roots of today's movement uh, were first uh, born. So goal number one, goal number one, to secure fully the essential human rights of our citizens, a domestic goal. About this particular goal, Truman said, Today, some of our citizens are denied equal opportunity for education, for jobs and economic advancement, and for the expression, expression of their views at the polls. Most serious of all, some are denied equal protection under laws. Whether discrimination is based on race or creed or color or land of origin, it is utterly contrary to American ideals of democracy. The recent report of the President's Committee on Civil Rights points the way to corrective action by the federal government and by state and local governments. Because of the need for effective federal action, I shall send a special message to the Congress on this important subject. So at that point, Truman doesn't really go forward with specific proposals or specific plans with respect to this issue that he has identified and this goal that he set. So you really can't see what he's proposing to do about civil rights and these issues that he's just raised up unless you go to that special message to the Congress, which he gave, uh, on February the 2nd of 1948, less than a month later. So I segue to that because what Truman said in his State of the Union about civil rights was not complete, as he noted. One must look at what he said in his special message to the Congress to get a more complete picture of what he was proposing. You can't get a complete picture without considering the two speeches together. The special message was given, as I mentioned, on February the 2nd. In it, he said that relative to civil rights, America was founded upon and holds the following beliefs. And you'll identify each one of those, quoting Truman from his speech. We believe that all men are created equal and that they have the right to equal justice under law. Second. We believe that all men have the right to freedom of thought and of expression and to the right to worship as they please. The third belief, we believe that all men are entitled to equal opportunities for jobs, for homes, for good health, and for education. The fourth belief that he stated, we believe that all men should have a voice in their government and that government should protect, not usurp, the rights of the people. These are the basic civil rights which are the source and the source are the source and the support of our democracy. That's what Harry Truman said to identify the beliefs that form the foundation of what's supposed to be our constitutional system of government. He went on to caution, however, he said, we shall not, however, finally achieve the, the ideals for which this nation was founded so long as any American suffers discrimination as a result of his race, 
or religion or color or the land of origin of his forefathers. Unfortunately, and now he's talking in 1948, there still are examples, flagrant examples of discrimination, which are utterly contrary to our ideals. Not all groups of our population are free from the fear of violence. Not all groups are free to live and work where they please or to improve their conditions of life by their own efforts. Not all groups enjoy the full privileges of citizenship and participation in the government under which we live. He then concluded, we cannot be satisfied until all people have equal opportunities for jobs, for homes, for education, for health, and for political expression, and until all people have equal protection under the law. <clears throat> He then makes reference to the report of the President's Committee on Civil Rights, the to, sec to Secure These Rights report, and its findings. And then he says in this speech to the Congress on February the 2nd, the protection of civil rights begins with a mutual respect for the rights of others, which all of us should practice in our daily lives through organizations in every community and in all parts of the country, we must continue to develop practical, workable arrangements for achieving greater tolerance and brotherhood. The protection of civil rights is the duty of every government, which derives its power from the consent of the people. This is equally true of local, state, and national governments. There is much that the states can and should do at this time to extend their protection of civil rights. Wherever the civil, wherever the law enforcement measures of state and local governments are inadequate to discharge this primary function of government, these measures should be strengthened and improved. And here's what really got to the Southerners. The federal government has a clear duty to see that constitutional guarantees of individual liberties and of equal protection under the laws are not denied or abridged anywhere in our union. The duty is shared by all three branches of our government, but it can be fulfilled only if the Congress enacts modern, comprehensive civil rights laws adequate to the needs of the day and demonstrating our continuing faith in the free way of life. After that, he makes the following six specific recommendations to the Congress relative to the issue of protecting the civil rights of all but implicitly mainly of black American citizens. Again, I'm quoting Harry Truman from his February the 2nd speech. I recommend therefore that the Congress enact legislation at this session directed to the following specific objectives. Number one, establishing a permanent commission on civil rights, establishing a joint congressional committee on civil rights and establishing a civil rights division in the Department of Justice. Number two, strengthening existing civil rights statutes. Number three, providing federal protection against lynching. Number four, protecting more adequately the right to vote. Number five, establishing a fair employment practice commission to prevent unfair discrimination in employment. Number six, prohibiting discrimination in interstate transportation facilities. He had four other recommendations that he made in that speech, but since they weren't necessarily directed towards the rights of blacks in um, the southern states as well as the entire nation, I didn't put those in my quoting from his speech, because I think these are the primary ones 
that refer back to what he was really talking about in his State of the Union address. He goes on to elaborate in his special message specific ways he proposes that his recommendations be put into effect, which I'll leave it to you to read on your own if you're interested in doing that. I thought particularly in light of the events of the past 10 days or so in our country that a detailed look back to President Harry Truman's State of the Union address to the Congress related to civil rights was worth our time in this class today. I hope you agree. Now, I sort of intended to stop at this point so we could discuss those specific things if you guys are inclined to do that because I think these things have such a powerful impact on where we are today. And I can kind of lead us through that, that I wanted to kind of leave us with civil rights on our mind as we go from this class and we go into our, go into our bigger world after this class. <clears throat> so let me tell you that next week, I'd like to take up the balance of Truman's State of the Union message and the election of 1948 and the Republicans who were competing against one another for their party's nomination and other issues as we go forward. But this whole issue of the State of the Union message, the Declaration of Independence, what Truman said in his February message to the Congress, and, and the history of these particular recommendations is just fascinating. So um, let me throw this out on the table. The first recommendation that Truman made in his uh, message in February, which really needs to be added to the State of the Union address to understand the whole picture, his first thing was to establish a permanent commission on civil rights, a joint congressional committee on civil rights, and a civil rights division in the Department of Justice. So comments. Do we know, do we know for example, when those things got accomplished. I'll have to admit, I didn't go and look up the history of that particular part of this. Anybody knowledgeable enough about the history of those things to suggest uh, an answer to the question of what happened with regard to those recommendations? Remember that you need to unmute yourself in order to comment or um, answer David's query. And if you want to Google it, go ahead and Google it. Go ahead and Google it. David, I think it was at the time of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department got founded. Uh, I'm not sure about the Civil Rights Commission. There were several of them at different times, including in 68, but I'm not sure when a permanent Civil Rights Commission was established. You're brave, Don. Well, we can come back and talk about that one a little bit more <clears throat> because I think the next one, for example, is, is more obvious uh, based on our knowledge of what happened. So the second recommendation was strengthening existing civil rights statutes. So when did civil rights legislation, as we understand it at least, actually happen? Dave, um, Ann Canfield sent yes, a yes. chat to me that says EC or EEOC formed in 1965. And that yeah. was formed in connection with what happening? The Voting Rights Act. <laughs> and well, and also the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yeah, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, I think, were the two major pieces of legislation. It was a voting rights act that dealt with things like poll taxes and that sort of thing. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights was uh, yeah, speak up. the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights was started in 19, created in 1957, where they investigate, report on, and make recommendations concerning civil rights issues in the United States. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Google. Never, so so uh, with respect to those issues that we've talked about, suffice it to say that they didn't happen in response to Harry Truman's recommendations or proposals. They didn't happen um, 
in that election year of 1948. And, and keep in mind as we well, I, I would kind of disagree, maybe disagree. I don't know. You know, the way the slowness of the way things work, it could have been a result of him. It might have just taken that long for it to occur. I don't disagree with that proposition at all, Ted. But uh, Truman's proposal and the immediacy of his desire to have it dealt with didn't happen during his presidency. I guess that's my point. But I agree with what you're saying. The foundation of what happened later on was laid right here and right at this time that we're talking about by these actions. I'm remembering yeah. the comment in the, uh, uh, the paper on preparing for the run in 1948, where it's saying, you probably won't get a lot of this stuff, but it will put you on record as being in favor of it. So a lot of the things he's proposing, I, I assume he's assuming that are not going to happen, but they're putting them out on the table. It's, Go ahead, Judy. It's Judy. I'm, I'm just thinking about everything that happened. Um, we have, um, okay, we had, um, okay, we had the 50s. In, in the mid 60s, we were into, um, you know, the hippies and the anti war, and there was a real kind of opening up of America to, to rights, which is interesting. It wasn't that long after. Um, the 50s, we were still getting back from the war and everything was beautiful and we were rocking and rolling. So, um, you know, it was like another 10 years before the, the young people started, you know, <laughs> liter literally ramming the barricades and sitting in and um, beginning to, um, to question the government and what it was doing. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me see if I can uh, respond to that just a little bit chronologically. Civil rights legislation in the early 60s was pending, was there, but it really wasn't until John Kennedy was assassinated and Lyndon Johnson from Texas became the president that there was this emotional response to Kennedy's assassination and Johnson, the Southerners, pushing of civil rights legislation that the 64 and the 65 Civil Rights Acts got, got mm -hmm. passed. And that was really before the main objections to the Vietnam War were happening. Yeah. 68, 69, and 70 was the height of the protest movements, quite frankly. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and Ann Canfield is making a chat comment. Hopefully, Ann, I'll get to that, not today, but we'll get to that as we go through the year 1948, because the point I was trying to make here, among others, was these are the things which we take for granted as being valuable insights and valuable values. I think most all of us listening today would say, yes, Truman was right. But there was a hardcore of Southerners who rejected what he was saying in whole cloth. And it pushed them to drop out of the Democratic Party and create their own political party. So that was more, and the, and the actions that he took by executive order didn't happen until I think it was July or later in 1948 with regard to the military and the federal workforce. We'll talk about that later. Hmm. Okay, I, this is Bill Webb. I yeah. find it interesting that in, in my memory, the thing that really came to fore was the desegregation of the schools yeah. sometime in the 50s. Yes. And this was not a legislative, uh, you know, this was an action precipitated by the legislative body. It was one precipitated by the Supreme Court. That's exactly right. Yeah, and Eisenhower sending the National Guard or whoever it was he sent, I think it might have been the regular army, anyway, army. sending them to the Central High School in Little Rock um, was executive action that was taken to enforce the decision of the Supreme Court that schools be desegregated with all due deliberate speed. So Brown versus the Board of Education was, I think, in 1954, Don or some other lawyer might correct me on that. I think that actually came out in 1964, but it wasn't until I think 57 or 58 that those schools um, were desegregated with the 
help of federal troops by executive direction. So yeah, that's stuff that was happening that really flowed out of the change in thinking that first came out of the Supreme Court, quite frankly. Well, I've left you all speechless, I guess. <laughs> Well, we could do a compare and contrast without being totally specific, but I wanted to share the words that Harry Truman chose to use in multiple addresses, both to the public as well as to the Congress, about what he considered to be foundational, not only in terms of the moral and spiritual nature of the American citizenry as a whole, but also our foundational aspects, philosophically and ideologically, the basis on which our country was founded. And, and we've continued to struggle with that unresolved issue of the foundation of our country, which was slavery. And so the issue of slavery and the introduction of a black population into the colonies has led so all of these things that we've talked about, at least in the area of civil rights with regard to blacks and whites and the Civil War and Jim Crow and Reconstruction and all that sort of business, and it continues to play itself out in the world today. And when I hear people uh, talk about the world that we are in today, yeah, and America's original sin, um, I don't think people can understand it or talk about it intelligently without having this foundational knowledge in their memory bank. And it's not just stuff that's happened during our lifetimes, although we, for those of us, you know, old enough in a period of time that we were aware of things, can go back to the 60s when we were still more impressionable than perhaps we are today. And think about Kennedy's assassination, the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65, Martin Luther King Jr. being assassinated in 68, Bobby Kennedy being assassinated, Abraham, you know, Martin and John, and somebody who said the other day, the three assassinations that affected them perhaps the most were Kennedy, King, and Kennedy with the initials KKK. I thought that was just an astounding <laughs> comment on, uh, you know, something that just was a happenstance, but that's the initials of those three people. So though that's the story of our lifetime, that some of this stuff preceded us, but not that by that many years for most of us, with Harry Truman and his presidency, or the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, or all the way back to 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. So this history is just an astounding uh, panoply of events that we should all know perhaps more about than we do. So that's why I thought it was worth spending more time on it than I might otherwise have. I, I wanna thank you, I'm fascinated partially because a lot of us are around my age and our parents were listening to Harry Truman, mm -hmm. um, you know, in 48, 49, 50, and um, how forward thinking he was and how much he demanded of, of the American public and, and people, um, you know, humanity. I, I, I'm very impressed with, with him as a person and um, with his leadership. Well, one of the things that I want you all to keep in mind as you think about Harry Truman, who is that his life is really the spine of these series of classes, although I don't just stay on the spine, but I do come back to it from time to time. Um, this man, Harry Truman, who accidentally became the president of the United States, was only, I guess you could say two generations, but one and a half generations removed from the Civil War especially on his mother's side, his grandparents on his mother's side had slaves, had servants, household servants. He grew up in a state where slavery was legal or state slavery happened in Missouri from a lot of us live. Um, and so he grew up in Independence, Missouri. And I think the general notion was that he grew up in a sort of a Southern mentality, most of the people that he was around. And his own words to be quoted back to him 
were not politically correct based upon the world that we live in today. But having said all of that, and keeping in mind that this is a man, <laughs> somebody says, <laughs> maybe Harry should have taken his Bible to St. John's, St. John's for a photo op. Yeah, I thought about that as I was <laughs> preparing for this class, David. Um, but Harry Truman, the man with that background, and interestingly enough, the story is he learned to read on his mother's knee and she used the family Bible as the textbook. So his knowledge of what was in the Bible was pretty extensive. Anyway, that man with that background said those words and expressed those proposals in 1948 when he was running for re-election. To me, that's the astounding story, story <clears throat> excuse me, of Harry Truman's growth as an individual human being during his adult life, during his senatorship, and for time as president of the United States. Was I muted, Lori? David? We can hear you fine. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say that the two stories that underscore your point for me is when Harry Truman so proudly wore his uh, army blue uniform into his house Grandmother and his time. grandmother turned to him and says, don't you ever come into this house in that uniform and literally threw him out. Right. The right. other one is when he uh, politicking uh, uh, went to, I think it was Blue Springs and they had a Klan meeting going on and he had to deal with it on the spot and he dealt with it on the spot. And uh, the, the clash of those two things and the vision that comes from it uh, is uh, uh, typical of a great leader, but also I think indicative of a country that moved and continues to move, even though by bits and starts, but that's pretty radical moving. Yeah, for, for those of you that don't know the story and haven't been with us since the beginning of time, uh, where Truman Corner Shopping Center is today, it's considered to be part of it, considered to be the Truman Farm. Actually, it was the Young Family Farm. Harry Truman's mother's maiden name was Young. And her parents made claim to that property out there by out there where Truman Corner Shopping Center is today. Uh, and that was the Young Family Farm when Harry Truman was growing up. Uh, and even up until the 50s when that piece was sold off to the folks that developed the Truman Corner Shopping Center. Anyway, when Harry Truman was a young man living in Kansas City, he joined the, I think it was the Missouri National Guard. Uh, and uh, at some point in time, he had a blue uniform that was the same color as the Union uniforms were during the Civil War with the piping on the shoulders and all that sort of stuff. The background story was that at some point in time during the Civil War, Jim Lane, who was a, a Union general, and he was a senator, I think, from the state of Kansas, he was the general in charge of the Red Leggers that came over into Missouri from Kansas, sort of like Quantrill was, uh, the bushwhackers that went over into Kansas from Missouri. Anyway, Lane and his man, men one day during the Civil War came to the Young family farm out near where Grandview is today, and pulled out their weapons and took control of the farm and butchered a bunch of hogs, uh, cut the hams out of the back end and left their carcasses to rot, uh, demanded that Mrs. Young bake biscuits for them until her hands blistered, uh, shot the chickens in the yard and left them there, and put a noose around Harry's 15-year-old uncle, whose name was also Harry, Harrison actually, for whom Harry was named, uh, Harry's grandfather was gone out west on a wagon train trip at the time, and so he wasn't around any place. He was thought to be a Confederate sympathizer, although he had signed a loyalty oath. And so um, Grandma Young was mortally offended by these fellows' presence on her farm, their farm, and what they did, and their stringing up of her son, Harrison, who was 15 years old at the time, threw the rope and the noose over the oak tree branch and put it around Harrison's neck and wanted to know where his father was because they knew he was a Confederate sympathizer and was hiding out in the cornfield or was out on the run hiding from them somewhere. Well, Uncle Harrison said he's not around here and they stretched the neck further, stretched his neck further 
And he said, no, he's not around here. And finally, before they strangled him, they got tired of their game and threw the rope back over the branch and let him go. Well, that was a story that was very prominently told over the years with regard to the Young and then the Truman family. And Harry Truman was well aware of that. But in any event, it affected his grandmother as well as his mother, who was, I think, a teenager when that happened. In any event, as Bill Eckhart mentioned, when Harry went out to the young farm as a very young man with his proudly displaying his new blue uniform, he was told in no uncertain terms never to come back to the farm wearing that uniform again because the last time someone had been there in that colored uniform, what I just told you was what had happened. And interestingly enough, according to Harry Truman, he never did go back to the farm wearing his blue uniform. Anybody else? Things we've talked about before, things that have been triggered by what we've talked about this morning. David, were there any black people um, participating in forming the planks or were they just totally not involved for the platform? I don't know the answer to that question, Wendy. There may have been some from the northern states that were delegates to the convention. Um, it wasn't until 1968 that the Democratic Party adopted rules for delegate, delegate representation that um, opened up mandatory uh, delegate selection from different groups of people that had to be met. And so at the time of this convention, most of the delegates, not all, but most of the delegates were actually picked by local organizations, maybe the state party chairman. So there was um, a, a desire, if you remember what it said in the politics of, politics of 1948, to try to get the black vote, which at that time was sort of more Republican leaning than Democrat leaning. And so it was sort of up in the air. There may have been a handful of black delegates, but I'm gonna guess they were very small in number, but I really don't know the answer to that question. Well, it reminds me of about 10 years ago in Colorado, I went to the caucus and then I ended up going to the next two levels uh -huh. and um, they were developing the plank for the platform and gay rights came up and the people on the stage said, you know, we're really for gay rights, but it's really going to hurt us in our election chances if we put that in the platform. So would you please, please, please allow us not to put that in. And so then they voted and there were just like, I was really surprised. There were like a million, um, like proportionately, I would say there was like maybe 75 to 90% of the people in that group, in the whole group that were deciding the planks were gay or for gay rights. And, and they just like the whole place just erupted in applause. And so they ended up having to put it in. And I thought that was so interesting because it really paralleled what you were saying, um, even with the civil rights that they had said it wasn't politically going to be to our advantage. Interesting. Well, and that's supposedly that's how our democracy moves forward with regard to these issues when they, they exactly from the ground level uh, to ultimately become policy. I have a question about the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes. Um, have I got the wrong war or, I mean, it certainly wasn't uh, desegregated at that point. No, they were a segregated unit that was trained to, to fly. They were limited, but they, they, they served with distinction and they flew missions, but they were not in, a, in an integrated uh, military unit. The Tuskegee Airmen were all black. But and it I've was World War II, you're right. And I've heard things, you know, that a lot of the, the Blacks were sacrificial soldiers. So, you know. Well, I, I think the facts are, and I don't know, Bill Eckhart's got a long military career. He may factually be able to speak to this better than I can. But my understanding is that a, a large percentage of the Blacks that served in the military during World War II were still relegated to doing 
what we would consider to be more menial or domestic type of uh, type of, of activities. It's not to say there weren't some that were engaged in infantry and they weren't engaged in military activities, but I think there was still a bias against them serving in, in active military activities. And so while there were some, I think the majority were still doing domestic type of things. I, Is that right? If I if I can jump in, that's that's correct. The black units themselves did uh, quartermaster type things and uh, uh, rarely fought on the front. Uh, but the Tuskegee Airmen and around here the Buffalo Soldiers are those who served, and they were so they were proud of their service. They recognized that the better soldiers they were, the better they would help their cause for integration in the armed forces and their cause for their people in full citizenship. And the pride of a black family with a Buffalo soldier or a Tuskegee airman knows no bounds and it's totally justified. And they are the heroes, uh, if you will, the plank across the, the divide between segregated and integrated armed forces. And that's the reason when you see a Tuskegee Airman or a Buffalo Soldier uh, a uniform, sometimes I've even seen them in town here, uh, it's a recognition of that and of, of unbelievable respect. That's the way I would, would, would answer your question. But, okay, uh, thank you. Well, and, and finally, and we probably need to be wrapping it up, we're past time, but um, I've only been over to the uh, uh, facility in Leavenworth once, and that was uh, the tour that Bill Eckhart sort of led us on over there with the help of some of the people at the command college. But there is a fantastic oversized statue there of a specific uh, Buffalo soldier. And I think he's representative of something that would have happened more on the frontier than during World War II. But if you ever get an opportunity to go over to Leavenworth or the fort over there and take a tour, I think you'll be struck by the representation of that particular statue and what that represents over in that place, which is basically within our metropolitan area. And I don't think, did that represent a particular person, Bill, or was that just a... Unit? No, I, that, that represents uh, uh, two uh, uh, units of uh, black soldiers and black leadership. And I think that's significant in what you're talking about, because you talked about three stepping stones today to where we are. Truman's 1948 order to integrate the armed force is, was far more important than I think history gives it credit for. The, the Supreme Court decision in 1954, don't forget that uh, when Eisenhower learned about that decision, he says, well, the courts made the decision, let them enforce it. <laughs> and then years later, when it came time to enforce it, by George, he did, didn't he? And then you come with almost, President Kennedy wasn't interested in civil rights legislation and could never have gotten it through. It was Lyndon Johnson who was so skilled that with the most difficult bill at all, he had that bill in his mind before it was ever drafted. Never have you seen such competence in moving through civil rights things. But those three steps, and my point of making those comments is, is uh, uh, Truman's integration of the armed forces set off a march that uh, gain speed and, and, and gain respect and other things that uh, I think is far more important than it's given credit for. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else before we wrap it up for today? Well, thanks for your participation. I thought this might be a subject <clears throat> that would be more in tune or more appropriate for us to talk about these things today. And there's Brent with the Statue of Liberty behind his image there for those that can, of you that can see his thumbnail. Thanks for changing to that, that's cool. And so hopefully as we go through the next week, some of this stuff will resonate with you and you'll be better informed at least from an historical perspective to understand just how we've gotten to where we are in the world today as American citizens. And perhaps as we see the emotional reaction of our fellow black citizens to the killing of George, or the, you know, the murder basically of George Floyd and the fallout from that and the memorial service that's gonna be held, 
you'll keep in mind uh, the idea that in order to really appreciate what those people are going through, at least the black Americans, you almost have to walk a mile in their moccasins or try to put yourself in their shoes to understand their reaction to what they've observed. So with those remarks, I say we're done for the day. Thanks for being here. And we'll pick up with goal number two in Truman's State of the Union message next Thursday morning. Lori, anything? Nope, thanks to everyone. This will be on YouTube later today, first thing tomorrow morning. Um, thank you all for being here. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, David. You're welcome. Thanks, David. You're welcome.